Hank, I need to talk to you. After watching that movie the other night, it made me think about where I want to spend my final resting place. So I went right out today and I bought a plot. I couldn't wait. Because I've decided that I want to spend eternity next to someone that I really, really love. Oh, well. So I'm going to be buried next to Fuzzy McGee and Dad Gummit the Mule. Well, what about me? Let's rock. I get them open. Whoa. No Man Presents, live from the Nudie Bar, the Married with Children Podcast. And here are your hosts, Dan, Jamie, and Ash. This is a big episode. I'm excited. My name is Al. And my name's Dan, and mm, got some milk in my teeth. Do you want some dental floss? <laughs> Please. <laughs> You've got all this now. You're already in heaven. Oh, Ooh. this is true. <laughs> Lacey Lou in the house. That's me. Everybody's in heaven now because you're guest spotting. Oh. Yes, yeah, so uh, obviously Lacey is Dan's girl, and you guys have a show together. Tell people where to find you two. Well, Alex, um, that would be on horophilia.com. Like Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alex, I'll take for 300, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> you can find Cut to the Chase on horophilia.com. We are. Trying to finalize our top ten movies list uh, for the last year, and not just horror. It's not like- just horror. Yep, yep. So, uh, so yeah, it should be fun, man. So, look forward to that one coming up soon. Nice, man. Yeah, I was. I am actually because I'm glad you guys just don't because you know that's a horror podcast, and so is this show, frankly. And neither one of them are just horror based, and I really like that. Me and Dan did horror since 2012 for so long and we just had to branch out and do other things so i'm glad that's what your guys show is based on yeah no like honestly um i mean horror is always going to be my first love when it comes to film but honestly there are some times where i need a breather from it you do you know uh we did the 31 um you know 31 day october challenge right failed 31 days of halloween yeah we got to 25 failed <laughs> well we were really busy we were in that close month, to be dude fair. we were close but we failed yeah nice but i mean there were some <laughs> movies in there that you know they gave me like watching that many consecutive because we break it up pretty good of you know the of what we watch it's not right. like consistently for but for that month it you was have to go it, balls the it was like straight horror after horror movie right. and burnt out yeah no well and I mean we watched um, Hell House LLC and the Kipsy tapes back to back and. Huh. I, I, you know, I, I literally had nightmares right. and like, I mean, it, it's not like I was scared while I was watching them or whatever, but like it messed with my subconscious. Right. Like, you know, I couldn't establish what was real and what wasn't in my dream. Right. It really messed with me. Right. That yeah, sounds cool something. though. I think I'm going to try that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but dude, that, that's the thing though. You need something to break up the monotony unless you're like a glutton for punishment like yeah. Alex and he wants the nightmares, but like you need something. And that's what this show, though, Married with Children, provides, too. You know, I love talking about stuff that's that's kind of out of your, your wheelhouse, so to speak. And when Alex asked me initially to come on the show, that's what it was. Because, A, we've done a million shows together and we have that rapport, so that's all yeah, set. Yeah, you guys have that banter. And second of all, I, I guess I technically provide, like, a different perspective. Um, well, different than yours anyways, Alex. And that's what makes it fun because you grew up with it hardcore. Me, uh, I don't know, maybe like 30, 35%, you know. Right, yeah. In my yeah, so it's just been fun though, man. Like this whole experience has been so much fun. And Lacey Lou has been a big part of it, you know, helping me get together my notes. And this started when, when she was living with me in Massachusetts. I'm now living here in Iowa. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, um, you know, when, when I went and uh, stayed with him for, you know, two and a half months, um, he would do this show like you guys did double recordings on yeah. um, 
oh yeah you know sunday mornings like right. he would do two episodes at a time and you know, i kind of missed like where me and him would just you know lay there and watch two episodes of Mary with children and you know we'd have that banter and like obviously he'd come down and it was fun to listen back to like whatever it was that we had discussed in yeah. a sense you know to see what you could bring up and you know it was everything that i said obviously <laughs> yeah just like she wrote the notes down i just He's, he just steals there. everything that i say <laughs> <laughs> he's like let me try to read this in my voice <laughs> <laughs> exactly so but uh, no she's been there for for a long time and uh she's been an integral part of the show uh from a behind the scenes perspective Hi, this is Amanda Burst, also known as Marcy Rhodes Darcy, and you're listening to the Married with Children podcast. We are reviewing Death of a Shoe Salesman, Season 7, Episode 10. Director Jerry Cohen, writer Stacy Lip, special guest star Dan Castanel... Yeah, I can never say this guy's Nobody name. Nobody ever can, dude, ever. Castellaneta as homer simpson oh no i'm sorry no he's not that either <laughs> he's the funeral director james sweeney as priest emilio borelli as italian man laurel lockhart as lorraine robert Ackerman as harry bill applebaum as new Newca- newscaster's voice <clears throat> and guess who's not in this episode ha uh, seven yep that's it <laughs> Listen, what do you do in the last episode? Slip Al's shoes on and disappear? So now they're like, you know what, dude? And unless we're going to bury you next to this mule, we don't even want you in this thing. <laughs> Be fair, they did explain it. This was the best explanation possible. The, the explanation as to where he went, which we'll get into later, right. was probably the not only the best one to date, but it was it was almost like a meta way of them acknowledging like and how inconsequential this kid has been to the plot since day one. <laughs> and we love Peg's reaction to it, man. She could care less. Both of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, Al never cared, but I love <laughs> Peg. I love how Peg's arc has come around. Um, so while shopping for a burial plot for the family, Al and Peg discover they don't have enough money, so they have to be buried in the same casket. <laughs> Uh, so the, this title is a pun on Death of a Salesman, a 1949 stage play written by Arthur Miller. It won the 1949 Pulitzer Prize for Drama and Tony Award for Best Play. Uh, it premiered on Broadway in 49, running 742 performances. Wow. Yep. It's widely considered to be one of the greatest plays of the 20th century. That's where I heard the name from. Alex, we were talking earlier. I was like, I know this from somewhere. It's probably from that. Well, no. You know you know where you know it from? What? Do you remember, um, well, one of our favorite shows, honestly, is Dawson's Creek. <laughs> something just <laughs> Um, no, one of our favorite shows, honestly, is Dawson's Creek. And um, the play that Pacey, anybody who's watched it, the play that Pacey is in that he wants Joey to come see oh. is Death of a Salesman. Oh, is That's it? That's it. Oh, yeah. wow. There you go. So, do you remember? And, I you know, do. She went and seen the Northern Lights and said, and yep. he was so devastated that she didn't come to the play. It was season three. Yeah. Wow. You're welcome. Wow. The, time, the episode of that show is called uh, Northern Lights. I'm getting kind of scared because we're in Dawson Creek territory, which means we're tiptoeing on 90210 territory, which I don't want you two getting into. Oh. <laughs> That's dangerous. You know, Alex, anytime you want to start a 90210 podcast, no, well, I am your girl. <laughs> oh, and that sound we heard earlier was a, a stripper fell off the stage. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that is. Hey, it's okay. I'll, I'll spot our 10. Death of a stripper. Yeah. Alan Peg goes shopping for a casket. You must have some terminal disease. Yes. Marriage. But when Al chooses his final resting place, there's no spot for me. That's why it's called a resting place. He's going solo. I married you till death do us part, which means when I'm dead, I'm free to date. Married with children. And all new episodes Sunday. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Isn't this great? <laughs> ah, look at the Duke. One of his finest films. I shoot them because they're engines. <laughs> so they're, the family is watching I shoot them because they're engines, 
with the sound <laughs> off, apparently, because <laughs> uh, you don't hear anything until there's key moments that they want to talk about. Uh, it's Al, Kelly, and Bud all watching this um, John Wayne movie. Alex, do you remember uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we actually interviewed uh, one of John Wayne's stunt doubles? Ted White? Yes, man. How awesome was that? Yeah, man. Ted White is the guy who played Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th Part 4, The Final Chapter. And we interviewed him in 2013, I believe. As a woman viewer. What's your opinion, Pumpkin? Daddy, I would rather be reading. Does that tell you anything? (laughs) It tells me you're a girl, which means your opinion means less to me than the dogs. So Al's wearing that purple plaid shirt, which I hate. And the reason why is because that always marked the not-so-great era of the show. You know, like the classic Al outfit, the light blue shirt and the tan yep. tie and the tan pants and all that, like, and or the gray pants. That's like Al. And this is like when they wanted to like change the look and update the show or something. Mm-hmm. Now right. he's worn this purple shirt before, but now it's a thing. <laughs> you know, that's funny because um, obviously, like, this is the first episode I've done, but obviously, I've watched like older episodes of Married yes. with Children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way Kelly was dressed in this. It, you know, it's way more conservative. She reminded me of her character, Sue Ellen, and right. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's in that, like, little green, um, you know, business suit, like, right, you know. Right. And before, you know, she's, like, in these tank tops with her, you know, boobs hanging out. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is more so, more conservative. Right. So, I mean, it's kind of funny, the transition of going from, you know, what you have the image in your head of Kelly Bundy right. versus to what I watch today. Right. But it was Oof. completely different. It's funny you say that. We mentioned it in the last episode, how things are so different. Like, Peg said this crazy line to her, like, you're going to make some men happy one day. (laughs) It's totally pointing towards the slut Kelly that we really got in season, I'm going to say more like two and a half to five. Right. Yep. And that is gone, Lacey. I mean, that she doesn't exist anymore. And yeah, no, it's a different character. Oh, it's a different character. Like, now it's like, well, let's not focus on how many guys I bring home in a month. Now it's going to be how dumb I am. Right. And listen, it works it to a degree, but if you love Kelly and love every facet of her um, character and personality, then you're, you're taking one away from us. Right. De- totally. Totally, man. But what do you think? Well, Dad, I'm thinking this Duke guy walks a lot like you when you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I copied that walk because I figured the reason he does it like that is because no one in these movies ever goes to the bathroom. Well, that's what the folks in showbiz call it subtext. Could you, did you ever hear something so dumb? <laughs> you know what's funny about that though? I'm thinking that and the way John Wayne does walk, like it, that's kind, of, that's that's pretty funny to me. Like it's it's pretty accurate, I would say. <laughs> How do you walk like you have to go to the bathroom? I mean, <laughs> I, if I'm if I have like a turtle head popping out, I'm like, okay, I walk different, sure, but like a casually, I have to get up and go to the bathroom. I don't really do anything different, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> like, holy crap, man! <laughs> See, now this is Al's toilet humor. I got ripped. Me and Jerry got ripped for not liking the episode where Al's obsessed with his toilet bowl, the Ferguson, and all that, right? And all this, like, weird toilet humor that we thought was, like, a little eccentric for Al. Right. And everyone's like, oh, come on, man. You're just not getting the, the, the humor or whatever. And it's like, no, I get it. But you got to remember, not everything is funny to everybody, though. <laughs> yeah, no, we got it. <laughs> yeah, just because I can <laughs> identify that it's a joke, it doesn't really mean I have to laugh at it. <laughs> I think toilet humor and all that stupid stuff, it can be funny in the right context. And Al's usually in the right context. Like, totally. Him saying, well, I'm going to do uh, whatever first before he does something else, and he grabs a newspaper and puts it under his arms and go upstairs. <laughs> like, that's great. And most of it's great all the time. Him flooding the toilet on the plane or whatever, that's, that's great. 
But, yeah. um, you know, it might not work once or twice out of the, you know, 17 times they've done it so far. But, right. you know, it's mostly good. So yep. I, I don't think it's a big deal to not like uh, one or two moments of the show, you know, and whatever. Exactly. Yes. No, I wonder what kind of toilet paper they used to use in the old West. <laughs> Thank you for getting him started on this. <laughs> the real answer to that is rocks and leaves. I mean, not to burst anyone's bubble, that unless they had seashells they could scrape it with, like in that one movie, Demolition Man or whatever it was. The three seashells? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know about the three seashells. They they use wadded up pieces of tissue paper. <laughs> dude, dude, that that has plagued me, though, my entire life. Like, I need to know what the three seashells are all about. Like, I, I can't make sense of it in my mind. Right. Now, to get into our real wiping habits, uh, I, I'm i going to give some really good advice here, actually. Yes. Before you, if you're, like, going to the bathroom at work or really anywhere I think you should do this, especially at home, right? always grab a paper towel that you're going to use later to dry your hands, rip a sheet or two of that, probably two, fold it in half, and then... Turn the water on in the sink and really quick, just run it under the sink real fast. Then bring it to the stall with you. And then when you're done with this dry tissue paper, then use that and look at how much more you accomplish. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and some would recommend uh, same idea, like a baby wipe, you know? Right. Exactly. I know. I should have just said that. You're right. Well, no, but, yeah, but it's the same thing, though. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That That's why... I've always envied uh, the Europeans for bidets. Like, it's such a more efficient way than just wiping. Yeah, but how do they... Is it like a blow dryer thing that shoots out afterwards? How do you dry that after you're done? Th that I would just wipe, because it's just wet water. Who cares, right? <laughs> oh, my God. It's the Duke. Now he's going to start wondering when they went to the bathroom. <laughs> And who invented the toilet bowl? I'll tell you, to make a better movie than that damn Columbus. I mean, after all, America was already here. It takes some thought to think up a toilet bowl. And the answer to that is Sir John Harrington in, in, in 1596. Ooh. But the modern guy who made it possible for everyone to have toilets in every home was Thomas Crapper. <laughs> I swear I'm not that's, even kidding. That's not that's not real, is it? It's real, dude. Wow. And he, he also invented the ball cock. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know that big ball that sits in the water and it has a floater on it? Yep. Thank you, because I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that reintroduces water into your toilet tank. Oh. Yeah, and that floater, it knows when it's full and it stops it. Oh, right, right, right. Like a regulator. It's called a ball cock. Regulator. Yes. We could say that because it's true. Right, exactly. It is true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, to make a better movie than that damn Columbus. I mean, after all, America was already here. It takes some thought to think up a toilet bowl. Here's the thing about this episode. It is loaded, loaded with references and cultural... Right. Yep. It, it, it's crazy, dude. And so this little line of his... Back in 1992, there were two Columbus movies, The Discovery and 1492, Conquest of Paradise, uh, since it was the 500th anniversary or when Columbus, um, you know. They'll be also blue. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why all those movies came out during that time. That's why he took a jab at it. Yeah, does this Duke guy still make movies? No. Duke is dead. <laughs> You know what, though? Like, this is something I actually want to touch upon, though. Um, you know, watching, um, you know, when you were a kid and your parents introduced you to, like, movies or TV shows that they watched back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like, I literally remember sitting there, like, that at one point in time when I was a kid, you know, when my mom or my dad would make me watch, you know, something that they had watched back in the day. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so boring. <laughs> right. Like, do you, do you guys remember that? Did your yeah. parents do that to you as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. But now, ironically, uh, Nana watched a lot of John Wayne movies. She did. A lot. Still really? does to this day. Yeah. All the oh, time. That's all she wanted to watch. Like, when, like he told me that, and I'm like, now she's got to watch other things. He's like, well, nope. she watches the Patriots and the Red Sox play. Mm -hmm. Aside from <laughs> that, it's the Little House on the Prairie or John Wayne movies. Right. 
So her and Jamie would be like two, like peas and carrots. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I got lucky. My dad, he, he doesn't have many interests in life for sure, but he he had a couple good foundational interests for me. And one of them was he was really into Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thankfully, I grew up on Conan and Terminator and Commando and, you know, like all these um, Predator and all these amazing Arnold movies. I grew up on Kindergarten Cop. Yeah, but more importantly, uh, (laughs) Pumping Iron every day. Dude, Pumping Iron. (laughs) Oh, yeah, every day. (laughs) Every day. Uh, yeah. Well, when I got major into bodybuilding, yeah, that we used to do crazy stuff in the park and stuff and like use all the jungle gyms and everything just to get like weird workouts in that you normally don't use parts of your body. Right. I remember just like doing all that, all healthy, eating good. Then we all just plop on the couch and just watch Pumping Iron again for like the zillionth time. And no, it didn't phase anybody. We'd have fresh new comments to say about it every time we saw it. Oh, yeah. Pumping Iron was a huge positive part of my life. So and, and my dad liked a couple other cool things, um, too. So I didn't get tortured, really. Oh, yeah, and Abbott and Costello was a big thing of his. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, and I still am, am obsessed with them. I just bought their Blu-ray box set. It was $167. Oh, wow. For 30 of their movies, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm way, way into it. I'm willing to do that, you know? So, no, I got lucky. I, di- I didn't have the John Wayne syndrome like um, Bud and Kelly do. Yeah, I feel like, you know, maybe my parents were more... Um, multi-generational uh, with my generation, I guess, because they would watch, like, Breakfast Club or things like that. It was we lived with my grandparents for a bit of time when I was a kid, and um, I just remember my grandpa put on, like, Tora, 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 or whatever. Yep, yep, <laughs> and I was yep. like, why? Why? I'm like, I'm like an eight-year-old girl, or not, I was younger than that, probably. I'm, right. Like, I just wanted to watch, you know, like, Rugrats or whatever. Saved by the Bell. I don't think I was old enough for Saved by the Bell at five, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about that guy, Daddy? Does he still make movies? <laughs> Blackie Rabinowitz, king of the bad guys. <laughs> Alas, he's dead, too. That's a joke about uh, Jewish actors playing non-Jewish bad guys. Ah. Uh. What about the white guy playing the Indian? (laughs) He's dead. What about the white guy playing the black guy? Yeah. Yeah. Thought went automatically to the movie Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. That's what it is. Well, yeah, that was a play on what used to go down. Yeah, exactly. Um, So the the joke is about Iron Eyes Cody, uh, who was an Italian who was famous for portraying Native Americans in Hollywood films. Whitewashing, they call it in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, dude. No, they do. That's what they call it. They call it whitewashing. Um, you know, it's it's the same thing, and we've talked about this because we co- cover horror movies, but when they remake uh, Japanese movies and stuff like that, and they'll do an American version, and, it's a, and, and not in all the cases, but in a lot of them, they're very watered down. They're quote unquote whitewashed. They're just, you know, they throw in American actors people know, and it's kind of a shell of the original story and doesn't encompass what, what the original story was set out to do. I'm sorry. And that's kind of why I like, um, you know, some of the sitcoms that are out today. Mm-hmm. Um, because I know a lot of the jokes in this show, um, people say you couldn't get away with. I think now. People don't watch a lot of sitcoms anymore, so they don't really know what, you know, sitcoms are getting away with. Um, but, I mean, there's plenty of, you know, kind of the diversified subject on, like, Blackish or, you right. know, Fresh Off the Boat. Like, there is. Yeah. Well, this guy, Iron Eyes Cody, he played a Native American shedding a tear about litter in one of the country's most well-known public service announcements, Keep America Beautiful, which was... <laughs> Later spoofed on Mario Children's Season 8, Episode 22, Ride Scare. So Ooh. how weird is that, right? Like a weird, really obscure tie-in, though. But So then she says, well, what about the white guy playing the black guy? <laughs> now, blackface was really common in Hollywood uh, in the early days. And Al Jolson is, you know, the jazz singer, you know, another Jewish guy in blackface. It was right. like a funny, weird combination. Right, that right, right. Always went down. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> dead. And him? Dead. And him? Dead. They're all dead. Everyone in every movie I like is dead. <laughs> Only me and Charlton Heston are still alive. <laughs> his head turned sideways? That's how you know he's a sidekick. <laughs> Look at Fuzzy's riding his mule dad going backwards. <laughs> Fuzzy McGee, the greatest of the sidekicks. Now look, he's gonna char, then spit. <laughs> he's hitting that mule on the foot. Now watch, now watch, he's gonna go, whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Fuzzy McGee, he's still alive. Matter of fact, he's still working. But he just made a commercial just the other day. You know, that one for adult diapers, Soakums. <laughs> you remember when you just can't quite say whoa anymore. I mean, they're for everyone. Hey, it depends on where you're at in your life. It depends! Hey, listen, just sign autographs, man. You have more dignity than saying that you wear diapers. Well, what if he signs a diaper? Well, that might be all right, then. <laughs> uh, I'll call I'll call Beetlejuice in this instance. I don't wear diapers. You wear diapers. Oh God! Remember that? So Fuzzy McGee, um, I believe he he was a composite by the Marywood Children writers of Western Sidekicks, uh, basically Gabby Hayes and Fuzzy Knight. Uh, George Francis Gabby Hayes is uh, in real life an intelligent, you know, well groomed, articulate guy who was often cast as a grizzled codger who said phrases like, uh, cost darn it, you're darn too in, daggum it, uh, darn persky female or whatever, you know, and you, you, young whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Yosemite Sam yelling at somebody or something. <laughs> and, and homage was paid to that guy in uh, Western Blazing Saddles. And the other guy, um, John Forrest Fuzzy Knight, he was an actor, uh, and he's most famous for Done Him Wrong, and he went on to play like hundreds of roles in the next 30 years, and by the 40s, he was basically doing uh, westerns, and was voted one of the top 10 money-making stars in westerns in 1940. So then he became uh, famous to a new generation when he was a sidekick to Buster Crab in Captain Gallant of the Foreign Legion. You you combine those two guys and I think you get Fuzzy McGee. Right. That well that yeah, that would definitely make sense. I was wondering if this was a real person. Yeah. Well that, that's because you haven't watched um Western Geezer Theater. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I missed it. Uh, yeah. I was too busy watching Joe Bob Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> He'll outlive us all. We interrupt Western Geezer Theater for a special announcement. <laughs> Chicago's beloved Fuzzy McGee, better known to our younger viewers as Sheriff Sokums, died today. Fuzzy is survived by his trusty mule, Dad Gummit. Yeah, he lived from 1902 to 1992. So it says Fuzzy was married three times. He had 10 kids, 22 grandkids, not to mention millions of fans all around the world. Never was a man so beloved. That whole thing, when the guy says all those stats about him, and then, you know, Al says, I, he says, I guess we're all here, and it's no one there besides Al and the mule. That's reminiscent of the ending of Death of a Salesman. At oh, okay. Willie Lomain's funeral. Ah. At Willie Loman's funeral. Hello, me. What? Are we ordering food here? Making me hungry. No, for a second, I thought you said Willie Lopez from Ghost. Oh, God. It's Willie Lopez. He lives in Prospect Place. Yes. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Oh, that, that was the other one I was trying to avoid. Do, do not get me started on Ghost. Oh, here we He's go. He's Puerto Rican. <laughs> I tried to watch it the other day. She stopped me. She wouldn't let me watch Ghost. Oh, dude, I have the Blu ray. I love that movie, man. It's amazing. I would like to love it. I just want to watch it. Oh, oh yeah, it's really good. Patrick Swayze is great, <laughs> and so is Molly Ringwald. Uh, oh, Molly Ringwald. Molly Jensen. No. Uh, you mean Demi Moore? Demi Moore. <laughs> yes. 
Her name is Molly in the movie. Yeah, oh, okay. Molly uh, Jensen. Yeah, Jensen. Okay. <laughs> well, the reason I didn't, he was going to watch it while I was working, and that's a movie like, there are some movies like I don't mind him watching without me or whatever, but this is like top 10 for me. A together movie. Yeah. Of all time. So, yes, it's a together movie. Oh, no, Thank I you. put it on. To, what a great way to put that. I wasn't really going to watch it. I just, put it on, I just put it on to piss her off, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. Everybody's dead. Makes you think about things, Peg. Life and death. Where we're headed. What's it all mean? Why, when a woman's shoe size is nine, her sock size is ten to thirteen. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. I think that's the one that bothers me the most. Don't worry, honey. You know, men have confusing sizes, too. I mean... Look how big your thumbs are, and yet, uh... <laughs> Fozzie McGee. Fozzie was married three times. He had ten children and 22 grandchildren, not to mention millions of fans all around the world. Never was a man so beloved. Well, I guess we're all here. <laughs> Al and the jackass are the only ones that showed up at the funeral. Yeah. And even the jackass walked away, but the other one's still there honoring Fuzzy. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Al's not a jackass. <laughs> I don't want to be mean. He was a wuzzy wuzzy sidekick, wasn't he? <laughs> he really was. Uh, so that comes from a nursery rhyme, believe it or not. I'm telling you, this episode's loaded with cultural stuff, dude. So the, fuzzy the, Wuzzy wasn't so Fuzzy Wuzzy? Uh, fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't Fuzzy Wuzzy? Fuzzy Wuzzy... <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> so there was a famous poem by English author uh, and poet... Rudyard Kipling, published in 1892, whose title is Fuzzy Wuzzy, and it contains hints of that nursery rhyme. So, yeah. a lot of stuff so, here, man. Bigfoot's origin story. <laughs> what do you think they come up with this stuff? Do you think it's something that, you know, is nostalgic to them, and that's why they implemented it in the script? Without a doubt. Oh, yeah. Stacy Lip must be way into this stuff. With, uh, <laughs> well, she, she writes the – she's on the most, like, I guess, eccentric episodes and, and most, like, niche things with, with things in it like that. But um, I knew that from my childhood, though. Fuzzy was yeah. Yeah. That's why I just knew it and I, I was going along with it. Like, Al said a line, too, where he's just like, everybody around me is dead. And I know, like, it's it's kind of a vague, like, whatever, you know, it's married with children or whatever. But, like, everybody has those moments where you find yourself looking back and, and you know, uh, times that you've shared with people, all those people end up being dead. And it really just kind of shocks your system. You know what I mean? It, it puts everything into perspective in a way where it's like, wow. Like, it's amazing how time can change those things. I think it happens less in your real life until you're in your older age. And then you see everyone around you dying until you're, you know, you're a holdout to whenever your day comes. But right. I think this happens a lot more, especially happens to me and you a lot more with things we grew up with t uh, pop culture wise, television and music. Right. When all of our musicians are dying, like Prince and some people like Michael Jackson and, you know, uh, even even people like the grunge guys I mentioned last week, you know, like Chris Cornell, Kurt Cobain. Chester all these guys. Man. Yeah, Chester. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got all these wrestlers dying. King Kong Bundy, you know, Mean Gene Oak. Gary Fisher, you guys. Oh, oh, my God. That one. Yeah. After seeing the last Star Wars, that one really killed me. Yeah, Carrie Fisher, right. They have to put a friggin' fake face on whatever they do with that thing, and they had to do it to her. She couldn't even make it through three movies. Like, it's crazy. It's like, what is happening? Everyone's Steve Dash, the guy who played Jason in Friday the 13th Part 2. I went to dinner with him, and three months later, he's dead. Oh, yeah. Dude. Oh, my God. I, You know, I thought about you as soon as I heard about that happening, man. Oh, yeah. And then and Luke Perry? Oh, that, that one was devastating. Yeah, 52? Uh, oh, that that one was probably one of the worst, you know. Oh, last year, yeah. 
definitely. Well, you know, and I feel like when you know, because um, this is relevant to this episode, um, that when certain actors do pass, you can tell, you know, ones that do leave an impact. You <laughs> yeah, know? Robin and, Williams. Yeah. Oh, I, I had a whole little, like, uh, memorial thing for Luke Perry on this show at the end of that one show, remember? Right. Um, yeah. Oh, no. Sometimes people just speak to you in certain ways. And unfortunately, we're going to have to talk about this with Al at the end of the episode, you know? I mean, that day will come, that horrible, horrible day when my childhood hero is really gone. And this will be one of the episodes you go back to, obviously, you know, just to get right. just like the baseball episode. There's going to be another one that you de- look at the name of it. <laughs> I mean, how right. could you not watch this episode that week that that happens? You know, yep. and one of the big sitcom actors for me that passed was um, Alan Thicke. Oh, yeah. You know, from. Yeah. Like that. I don't know why, but that one just like hit me. Um, cause that was a show that like, I obviously grew up with and, um, you know, he is the epitome of like the TV dad for me. I know a lot of people might say Al Bundy, but, um, <laughs> it's all what you grew up with. I'd say Jason Seaver before Danny Tanner any day, but, um, I mean that theme song and to growing pains, you know, show me that smile. Again. You know, mine was the guy from seventh heaven. Stop it. <laughs> oh God. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Like I love Sorry. Dan, you're the worst. (laughs) Sometimes I have some insanity dating you. I apologize. (laughs) It's going to be the death of a Dan soon. (laughs) Show me that smile again. She can't believe she's dating you after that line. (laughs) (laughs) She says that every day. (laughs) Fuzzy McGee. There was a man. And a great sidekick. Where are today's sidekicks? Oh, the potential of a young Rick Moranis or a Steve Gutenberg or Martin Short. <laughs> oh, the goofy, limping, word mispronouncing sidekicks they could be. But instead, they want to be stars. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Short couldn't even hold his own in Three Amigos. <laughs> But Fuzzy knew his place. He was a sidekick. Alex, you mentioned Steve Dash earlier. Mm. Um, so you had always told me about the conventions that you go to and, you know, how, like, your interactions with, with Kane Hodder and all these, like, iconic people with, with all these iconic roles. And it's just, I, I never really knew, like... What oh, was man. like? Yeah, like, what is that like? Well, I found out how that's like... When Steve Gutenberg kind of just walked by me like five times and just kind of like gave me a little head nod, I'm like, oh, that's definitely Steve Gutenberg. Like it was the weirdest thing ever. But at mm-hmm. the same time, it felt normal too. And all of a sudden, like um, it, it took a few days, but like in my mind, everything started to click, you know, right. how, 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 how those – things kind of work you know i that thought day. you were gonna mention the latex gloves the late oh well yeah he <laughs> dude he gutenberg looked like a seal. what was he inspecting you yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah man no he uh he made me dress up in a in a Stop cloth it. uniform no oh you're kidding. such a jerk man <laughs> <laughs> no but um but no it was it, <laughs> he did he <laughs> He looked like he looked like a serial killer. He looked like a serial killer he walking like, around with his blue latex. Clothes. Alice, did you ever watch the show um, Salute Your Shorts? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember that episode of Zeke the Plumber? Oh my God! Yes. Like if for episode of um, <laughs> Salute Your Shorts where they talk about Zeke the Plumber and you Zonky know, lives. yeah, it's, it, Steve Gutenberg looked like Zeke the Plumber at this convention that we yeah. attended last. He really did. Yeah. The first celebrity that I ever rode an elevator with was Marcy Darcy. Oh, my God. (laughs) That's crazy. Really? Yeah. Well, because um, the first Days of the Dead that I ever went to was um, to go to see one of my sister's favorite movies of all time. Fright Night? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, It was the Fright Night reunion. And I've been trying to get my sister to go to these conventions forever. But my sister had the biggest crush on Williams Wright, so, you know, is Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, 
You know, I mean, a beer was there. Right. So, um, yeah, and we're just in the elevator, and, you know, she's just, you know, just a person. Yep. You know, and it's crazy because this is the first attempt. This was, like, back in 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, and I, I wasn't even a writer for Pop Horror. I hadn't even joined any horror groups on Facebook at this time. So, <laughs> like, you know, God, just thinking about it, like, how full circle my world has come. Right. Yep. Right. You know, but, yeah, that was the first celebrity that I've ever really interacted with. I would have been, like, Steve or Jefferson, like, right out of the <laughs> game. <laughs> well, I, that wasn't what I was thinking. I was thinking Fright Night and Chris Sarandon and, you know. <laughs> right. Rodney well, we know her feelings on that question in this episode for sure. Oh yeah, we yeah. definitely do. But I don't want to even want to touch on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like how Al took uh, a jab at um, Martin Short because look at who was in the Three Amigos with him. Right. Like, isn't it like Chevy Chase and Steve Martin? And Steve, Martin. Steve Martin, yeah. Like, good luck holding your own there, pal. <laughs> I mean, right. Isn't that a little unfair? That's like a low blow, right? Right. <laughs> well, who would you say is the biggest out of those three now? Uh, Steve Mo Martin, I think. Well, Chevy Chase is the only one still technically working. Uh, Steve Martin does. Th no, uh, no, no, all, no, I'm I sorry. Think they all do, honestly. Steve Martin. What is Steve Martin? Uh, he did the stand up with Martin Short. Did he? On Netflix. Yeah, he did. I saw a little bit of it, yeah. No, I, oh, really? I was it that, good? I believe they toured together, too. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Like, just in the past couple years, yeah. Yeah, it was It was pretty good, yeah. No, uh, what's cool about this episode, though, is that, you know, he is... That Al goes to, like, his favorite icon's grave site, you know? And I feel like us as, you know, being as... Um, God, I'm trying to think of the right word in here. Um... You know, being as... Passionate? Yes, passionate. We'll go with that. That's close enough. <laughs> with the, you know, entertainment and movies and TV, um, obviously there's always going to be that one celebrity that we'd probably definitely go to their gravesite or funeral if... And no one else would care about, right? Right. Right, and, right. Um, No, so, like, I totally get that in that aspect. And the fact that he referenced his pop culture in this episode, that was oh. awesome constantly well even uh so he sings happy trails to um to this guy uh fuzzy and that's a song sung by roy rogers and his wife dale evans uh and that was the theme song uh for the 1940s and 50s radio program uh that they started in and the m members of the western writers of america chose that as one of the top 100 western songs of all time Wow. And what was the song that, um, you know, the family that comes in after, they're like, can you sing? Happy trails to you. Excuse me, sir. My grandfather died. He loved O Solo Mio. Two dollars you sing to him? O Solo Mio. We're talking about cash, right? O Solo Mio. Um, it reminded me of the Goonies because that's a song that you know the main <laughs> brother starts singing. <laughs> right. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, he always just started belting. Was he singing that when uh, the kid was getting thrown in the back of the car? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 You know what I'm talking yes. about? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was grossed out because the milk was spoiled in their fridge so she didn't add it to her coffee then al comes home and his oh. throat is sore and he just picks it up and chugs it in like the funniest position you see how his arm is like out and he's like his head's back and the he's putting the milk straight up like it was the funniest way to embrace chugging milk now number one i'm sorry i i drink milk i'm not one of these people who are against milk but that is disgusting yes to chug straight up milk out of the carton chocolate milk is one thing dude okay i have to bring this up because this is a memory that it's just embedded in, into my head. So when we were in Massachusetts, there was a day. I believe it was the same day. We were going to go see Halloween 2018 for the second time. Now, this is before. We went to Panera, 
and Panera was horrible. They overcharged us. It was ridiculous. It was raining. It was just one of the worst days ever. We ended up going to the movies, and... Um, well, I've been sick. Yeah. So, and, like, I was on antibiotics. Right. It, that's what it was. And, like, so when you're on antibiotics, it says, you know, drink milk or, you right. know, eat with. Eat something, And yeah. I just took the antibiotic. And, you know, it really, like, when you take an antibiotic on an empty stomach, it really, you know, kind of turns your stomach and makes it hurt. So I was like, I need some milk. Dude, I go into the store and buy her, like, one of those... You know, like one of those single, you know, milk single type serving meals. type milks. Yeah, yeah. I come back. And she I'm was so happy. she was so happy. She was like, "Oh my god, thank you so much, dude." Chunks. Oh, don't tell me you poured it into your mouth, though. No, no. So I opened it, and so that's the thing is where he's chugging this in this episode. Like I literally felt the chunks right away. Oh my god, curdled like is curdled, all. Yeah, like it might as well have hell. been like cottage cheese. It was so oh. disgusting. Like I threw up in my mouth. I was growing up thinking about. Like it right I feel now. like that was one of the worst moments of my life. I was like, I will forever now check milks, check anything before <laughs> I give you anything. I felt so bad. I was like, you yeah. Went back in Oh, I went back into the store. I waited for like 10 minutes for them to refund my money. The dude's like, do you want another one? I just looked at him with all the hate (laughs) and anger and rage in my eyes. And I said, no, bro, I'm all set. Can you picture Dan just sitting there with an open milk with his receipt? So (laughs) mad, dude. So mad. Like, here I am trying to be like a good boyfriend. Like, like chivalrous. Yeah, I'm like, I'm coming through. I'm going to get my girl some milk. And I get her <laughs> curdled milk. I'm like, you're a failure. Everything. Go home and think about your life. I'm getting my girl some milk. I'm getting, <laughs> like, I'm hooking her up. She's not feeling good. I'm going to take care of everything. I took care of nothing. I made it so much it, worse. It, he, he didn't even come back out with milk. I didn't. I refu- no, I refused. I bought it from another place. I refused to buy their milk. You're done. You're dead to me. Wow. You had to go home and reevaluate your life. I did. And I'm so sorry for anybody that just heard that story. <laughs> did you get any of that milk stuck in your teeth? Oh. Hey, no milk will ever be our milk. Oh. <laughs> Mm. Does the body good? Mm. Mm. Got some milk stuck in my teeth, Peg. Peg, I need to talk to you. After watching that movie the other night, it made me think about where I want to spend my final resting place. So I went right out today and I bought a plot. I couldn't wait. Because I've decided that I want to. Spend eternity next to someone that I really, really love. Oh, well. So I decided to be buried next to old Fuzzy. (laughs) Oh, honey. (laughs) And the mule. Honey, they, they really don't need their own plot. <laughs> Very sweet of you to think of them, though. What the hell are you talking about? Now, he tells Peg about this, and she thinks that he's referring to her vagina. <laughs> right? <laughs> She's like, oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and that is funny, right? Like, uh, what they they couldn't have possibly been smart enough to... Because we already said how they got the name for the character from, you know, who they... We're you know kind of right. combining together, but it is weird that on a show like this he said that, and then she thinks that it's almost like perfect, like it was meant to be, you know? Right, right. I agree. I agree that that line was meant. Right. They really knew how to work it. They knew how to make that name funny again, even though it's rhyming with fuzzy wuzzy and everything else already. It was funny, was it? Wow. I, I... It was funny, wasn't it? <laughs> It sounded yeah. like it rhymed, but right. when it came out, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't, and it really didn't. So now, then he says, and the mule. And then she still seemed to react as if he's still talking about her private parts, but I'm sorry, maybe I'm stupid. What What would the mule be on a woman? Well, if I was a female... <laughs> oh, her ass. Oh, right. Because a jackass. Right. right. Well, I don't know. As a female, I don't think 
the at any point in time being called fuzzy or a mule is endearing like that's not something i would be like oh you want to be buried next that's to me that's not really a general <laughs> term people use no yeah. maybe, maybe in the 90s it was like yo that girl got a mule on her like what <laughs> <laughs> look at her mule dude you bet you for now on we refer to chicks' asses as mules on this show. You know what? Let, let's do it. Let's start a movement. <laughs> yeah, a mule. <laughs> I like to mule it, mule it. Yo, did you see that mule on J-Lo? I like big mules and I cannot lie. You cannot lie. You other asses can't deny. That's what it was. Was it? Was it not funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't wait to see J-Lo's mule on the Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> oh, was she doing the halftime show? Yeah. He goes, yeah. <laughs> How happy is Alex that the Patriots aren't going to be in this Super Bowl? <laughs> I'm so happy it's going to be different. And then J-Lo's there. I mean, this is going to be the greatest Super Bowl in the last 10 years. <laughs> like, no, no, no. To be perfectly honest with you, You're like, welcome. I'm a Patriots fan, but the <laughs> fact that you were so happy that they didn't win and then I found I just found out J-Lo is doing the halftime show, I'm just happy for you, bro. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't dissing you or the Patriots. I literally, I don't hate them. I used to hate them for probably for being like the greatest thing in the world. But I just don't really want to see them again. You know, like it's really not about. Oh, okay, Here, here's the thing. The best team wins, period. So I know sports is an entertaining thing and everybody roots for their team. But at the end of the day, the best team wins, period. So right. whether that's entertaining for people or not, that it's it's an undeniable type of thing. So if you're a winner, then you're a winner. There's there's really nothing else to right. it. Well, that's I why I stopped what? hating them because I realized why am I hating them because they're good, right? You know. Right. So I said, listen, they're the best team. I'm not going to be a hater. Well, and bringing it back to this episode, I'm sorry I didn't mean to you know cut you guys off about the mule of. Uh, Jalo's Jalo's mule, yeah. But um, you know the line of when you know Al Bundy comes in and dating a bald man, I cannot. Wow! Uh, I can, you really went there? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I cannot resist the urge to, you know, like. Uh, he's like, guess what? She's like, they raised the minimum wage for the bald. <laughs> <laughs> That's so messed up. No, I, I I cannot pass up the opportunity. Like anytime any ball jump ever comes. Oh no, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> She's still mad about that milk, dude. Dude, <laughs> I know. No, I seriously feel like it's a curse. No, listen, the ball joke started way before the curdled milk, so let's let's not <laughs> use that. God. You're welcome. It's it's at least five to eight ball jokes a day, depending <laughs> on her, depending on how well, good well, she's well, feeling. Well, no, like he'll try to like like scold me or like be serious about something i'm like i can't take you seriously you she'll just care. St- no she'll just stare at me but she's not staring at me she's staring at my head she's just like i wonder like does it grow like forward or does it just grow out like i'll be oh talking about God. groceries i'll be like so did you want to get like some bananas and she'll be like i'm just I'm like how does that work <laughs> oh my god does like it literally looks like you know you took like hot wax strips you're and, done like, okay you're oh. done <laughs> did did were you guys ever fighting and she goes get out of here i'm tired of seeing my reflection in your head <laughs> no oh, but i will stop giving her stuff bro <laughs> no the last married her children gave you that i guess <laughs> right, she missed exactly. that one <laughs> Well, she didn't miss it now. Thanks, Alex. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm going to be buried next to Fuzzy McGee and Dad Gum at the Mule. Well, what about me? Oh, come on, Al. Let me be dead with you. <laughs> you know, we never do anything together anymore. And if this is the way you repay my love, when you die, I'm going to bury you in a dress. <laughs> With white hose that make your legs look thick. Uh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. We were just wondering, do you know where Seven is? No. Well, let me put your mind at rest. He's been living with us for the last three days. He walked in and wouldn't leave. Uh, He's improving slowly. He still can't read, write, or use a knife and fork. But he has learned how to chant, kill the Bundys with the other neighbors. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't mind, we were thinking of renaming him Henry after my father. Well, we're weak here. Do what you want. (laughs) What we want is for you to come and get him. He's irritating. He calls us dad and little dad. (laughs) 
this was a highlight of the episode for me, honestly. Oh yeah. But I feel like it's kind of a darker episode, so for them to come in and like break up the monotony of you know the death talk and everything, like I thought that was great. Well, okay, yeah. But, but then they brought it right back to the death talk, but for like the two seconds that they didn't, it was great. Well, no, but this this is what I meant though earlier. So the fact that they acknowledged that they haven't been using this kid character that they wanted to miraculously shoot Horn in, uh-huh. like why? It's made no sense. The fact that they addressed it, not that it made up for it, I'm not saying that, but I'm so glad that they addressed it in a way where he's been there for, what, three days? Yeah. <laughs> and you haven't even noticed. And they didn't notice. And I love that Peg doesn't care anymore. Right! Like, she was such a, she was such an advocate for this kid, and right. she, she was his number one flag waver. For it to go to that... To where she just had her her hands crossed, her arms crossed, and she was just like, whatever. Like, that was so funny to me because it was almost them just acknowledging the fact that, yeah, that was probably unnecessary. We're just going (laughs) to deal with it this way. But at least they dealt with it. At least they acknowledged it in a funny way. Right. Because. Well, how old is this kid now? Like. We don't know. Five or six. Five or six, yeah, depending on his birthday, yeah. But like, yeah, I don't know. It's just, but it, it's just, it was such an odd thing to begin with to have him shoehorned into this. For what reason? It served it's no. It's very much like my cousin Oliver, right? From Same like thing. Brady Bunch. Well, it He's... actually is my. Co- it's called the cousin Oliver syndrome. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> And I haven't been a part of the show at all, but like obviously, you know, uh, Dan will talk about the episodes with me. Um, for the ones that I don't watch. Um, and he's just like having this kid, like, <laughs> and well, and he talked about the beginning of the season, and, him, you dude. know, where, you know, obviously they, this was where she was pregnant and, you know, they tried to play that in right. and it just didn't work out the right. way it should have. Um, right. It became a running joke. But so, I mean, there are things that he tells me as, you know, like, cause I can't watch the episodes as you guys record them as I used to. Right. But, I'm too far uh, ahead. But no, he he keeps me caught up enough. Right, I, I'll give her the cliff notes <laughs> he's like, version. He's like, no, it's it, it's really ridiculous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where is this kid? Where did this kid go? And I was just like, that that really sounds like you know the Brady Bunch thing because um, that was a show that um, I used to watch when I was a kid when they did um, summer. Um, was it called summer? The summer block on Nick at Night. Was that it? Summer Block Party. Yeah, it was like Munster Mondays, something Tuesdays. Oh, 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 oh my yeah, god, yeah, I yeah. love you, Alex. Yes, Munster yeah. Monday, uh, Brady Bunch Wednesday, I Dream of Jeannie Thursday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it had all those shows, and I it, it played all those shows. Like it played like six episodes of each show. Right, I, right, right. And I loved it. Yeah. I literally loved it. Yeah. Like that was probably that's a really fond memory. Like honestly, like now that I like I'm like looking into space right now. Well, like, just thinking about like how happy oh, yeah. I was. But one of my favorite um, documentary or uh, pseudo documentaries. It was the Brady Bunch where he, um, you know, where he admits to, like, having sexual affairs with Florence Henderson and... Uh, what? Um, Maureen McCormick. Yeah. I have, oh God, what is it called? Well, that's hot. A mother-daughter combo. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Barry Williams slept with both. Greg Brady slept with his mother and his sister. Wow. So there's nice. That. It's very incestuous. Have you ever watched that? Um, no. Uh, I- I'll send you the link. I'll look it up later. But Wow. Uh, yeah, I want to see that. I need some whacking material. I mean, it, it, well, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't show it, Alex. It just talks about it. Oh well, listen. I have a good imagination. It's very much, pretty much the one of you know Justin Diamond's version of you know the Saved, Saved by, by the, the Bell. Bell. Yeah, where they're all scumbags. Yeah, right. Okay, Dustin. Okay, so. Um, yeah, well, this is actually getting funny with this whole seven thing. Like, it's actually this is actually making me laugh, and I'm I'm finding a lot more humor in how they get rid of him more than what he was supposed to do when he was on the show. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Now, but there are plot holes for days now in this episode. Now, the first one is Jefferson and Marcy saying he can't read or write or use a knife and fork. Yet, Dan, wasn't he? 
like, wasn't some of the highlights of him in episodes where him and Kelly, where Peg was, like, reading to them, and, and it turns out she was reading to Kelly, and Seven already knew all this stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Then they were playing Scrabble, and she's he's like, that's not a word. And she's like, no, it's just not a network. You know, <laughs> It was always about him being smart and Kelly being an idiot. Yep. N- now suddenly we're just throwing all this. Out the window? Yeah, it's all out the window. It no longer is his character. This, he's smart enough. He's smarter than even his older sister. Nothing like that. Now he is this. Like, suddenly he's some dumb hick who can't read or write or use utensils and stuff, and it's like, what? Like, this is not what we've been forced to watch for the this whole beginning of this season, this first third of the season. Right. The first third of the season's over, by the way. That was the last episode. That was the end of the first third. So we, we have two thirds to go in this season. <laughs> Yep. And another thing I want to bring up, uh, besides his lack of uh, continuity and character with this description, how about you guys notice that the shoe store is not in this season at all yet? And guess what? It's not going to be. Re- you know, that's a good point that you bring up. It, we haven't been to the shoe store at all. Well, and ironically, this is called Death of the Shoe Store. Right, and... In the last episode, Al is doing a shoe contest where he's trying to sell the most amount of shoes, yet we don't get to the shoe store. Now, that's got to be a situation where they don't have a set set up. Now, it's funny you say that. So, this was brought up by a YouTube listener. Uh, His name is The Van Dam Fan 2009. Hey, Van Dam Fan 2009. Yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, he said, you notice it's not in there. Why is that? He said, especially in an episode where Al's doing a shoe contest, he said the theory is they got rid of that set or it burned down. Right. Well, it burned down. (laughs) So would you say this season uh, is where it really starts to feel different than any other season? Like, So it did a few times, but no. If you told me this episode was season six, I'd believe you. Right. And we're at um, season seven. Yeah. Even if you told me this was a five episode, I believe you. I, I I think overall, and I think we've talked about this before. Us, this is where people start to point as to where they jump the shark during the right. season, right? With seven, though, just because of seven. Okay, I don't buy that because I, every episode that I've seen now, granted, they've made some bad decisions, but. Right. Overall, if they have bad episodes, you know, I don't think we've ever rated three episodes in a row. Um, exactly. Really low. And, and, and granted, they have low episodes, but I don't know any sitcom that doesn't have those episodes, those those kind of quote unquote throwaway episodes. Uh, fillers. Fillers. Yeah. Like stuff that. Yeah. Now, we talked about this briefly, Alex, before uh, we jumped on here to, to record about this, but. I think that this episode, like for me personally, this was this was atypical Married with Children. This was going back to the roots because they kept it really small. It they, they didn't get extra about it. Um, and the plot is relevant. The plot's very <laughs> the plot. Get it? <laughs> Whoa! No pun intended. Yeah, the plot is relevant though, but they keep it so simple, and their whole what they kind of bank on is the classic dynamic between you know Al and Peg. You got Marcy and Jefferson that come in. That's like that whole thing was gold when they came in. I thought, you know, um, yeah. Well, and like I said, like for such a low brow, low class show, like you know, people, you know, the haters of the show and everything, um, the amount of high cultural references in an episode proves that it really is high brow, intelligent comedy. Right. If you know, if you're like a well informed person, you'd be dying laughing at these jokes in this episode. Right. I'm not well informed in, in that way. You know, obviously it takes some research to figure a lot of these things out, but then you could go now that I am informed, I can, you know, uh b- between me and the Married Children research team and us cramming all this together, now we could watch this again or even through this review relive it, you know, in our heads and talk about it. And it's very thought out and involved and relevant. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely, dude. 
so Seven calls Jefferson dad and Marcy little dad. Now, that's the funniest thing Seven has done thus far. <laughs> and he didn't even do it. He it's did. off screen. Right. Right. No, I actually, Alex, the funny thing is I actually took notes for this episode. <laughs> she did, dude. And one of my notes just says, little dad. <laughs> <laughs> little dad. But, well, because it's funny. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> That no, like th- this whole exchange though was so funny because any time that Marcy is involved in any self-deprecation, right. it's so great because Al can say something and it's usually hilarious because it adds to it. Or more importantly, so, a lot of the times he doesn't even have to say anything. Like she just sits there and like the pleasure that he gets out of it is just worth it in itself. Like, it's so great, their dynamic, because anything, you know, a detriment to Marcy, like, is a win for Al. So he doesn't even have to bury her. She buries herself, so to speak. Right, exactly. And this is a great case of it. Like, why would you tell them? that? Would, like, that, I would t- take that to my grave if, if he did that. You know, like, I would never run around telling people that hate me that this kid refers to me as little dad. So, <laughs> as as much as I love this whole exchange, I ha- uh, there's there's obviously a problem with it. Oh, because she so, is talking about her ex husband. What? Yeah. <laughs> Marcy, we don't have time for this now. We are in the middle of an argument. Al doesn't want to be buried next to me. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? Well, frankly, yes. I think when two people take the marriage vows, it's sacred. That's why I'm going to be buried next to my husband, Steve. Uh, 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 my name is Jefferson, and I'm your husband now. And oh, and by the way, we are not in bed, so there's no excuse for calling me Steve. <laughs> he is your ex-husband. Oh, don't take it personally. Every woman screams out Steve during sex, don't they, Peggy? Not me. It's too long a name. <laughs> What do you think about this, uh, Alex? Because this is a this is a big moment. This is very telling in terms of Marcy's mindset. Well, no, but I think it explains it at the end. Right? Yeah, you know, it all does. Like as deprecating as it was to Jefferson, like at the end of it all, it's just a ploy to get better sex. She just wanted to make him work. Right. But I right. can tell you, as a divorced woman, <laughs> yes, that if I called you. A certain name <laughs> while we were, you know, uh, you would probably be like, oh, we're done. <laughs> oh, God. That thing would just disappear in his pants. He'd be like, okay, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about sitcoms. I think the Fresh Prince of Bel Air and Uncle Phil throwing jazz out the house. <laughs> That's what I picture with that happening, if that were to happen. And I, I am literally picturing that right now oh. as I'm worried my. <laughs> Uh, ghost face, ice cream. Ice, ice cream. cream. Ice cream. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing a ghost face t shirt that has him eating uh, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> him throwing me out the house as I'm calling him my ex husband's name. Right that would happen. It did. Yeah. No, but you're right, though. It it did work. It it did. It did work, but that was painful. And I was just like, I really hope Jerry doesn't listen to this episode. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure Jerry is going to have something to say about this. Listen, I, I know. Jerry Herring no, to say about no. This Hello, everyone. It's Jerry, aka the Married with Children podcast group park ranger extraordinaire. Now, let's get to the most important thing about this episode: the disrespect to Martin Short. Wait, I mean that Marcy is going to be buried next to Steve. You see, vows are important after all, and. Who else would you want to spend the afterlife with? Also, Marcy calls Jefferson Steve in the bedroom. And Jefferson is going to rock the Steve out of her. (laughs) Yeah, right. Now, Marcy claims she does this as a ploy to make Jefferson perform better. But we all know the truth. That no one is better in the sack than Steve. And Marcy misses that sweet lovemaking. While Steve is out there free in the national parks... Marcy is left to be with a second-class husband as she dreams of the life she used to have, sneaking off to watch the hotel tape she hides in the closet so she can relive the golden years of her life. Well, I'm off to watch a double feature of Razor's Edge in the poker game. See y'all in the Jiggly Room. 
Oh, don't take it personally. Every woman screams out Steve during sex, don't they, Peggy? Not me. It's too long a name. <laughs> <laughs> like that was the greatest one. Like I don't. That might be the most relatable one. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean relatable? Uh, uh, uh. Oh, are you kidding? With with Dan, you could say Stephen Bartholomew Rhodes and not be done yet, right? <laughs> with Dan, you could grunt that like n- mistakenly. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, you can at least say seven when you're doing it with me. <laughs> That's two syllables. <laughs> I, I really feel like I'm at the nudie bar. Oh, you are. Look around. We are tonight. <laughs> like there's neon lights. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Yeah, the hot chicks on stage. It's amazing. Yeah, Hayden Penetier to the right of Dan. <laughs> She's coming back to scream five. Do you have a thing for Hayden Pintier? No, but she wasn't good. Well, what do you mean? I think you have a thing for Hayden Pintier more than I do. What do you mean? 15 seasons of Dallas or whatever. It's called Nashville. Nashville, whatever. (laughs) Dallas. Whatever (laughs) show. Basically the same thing. She's like, this week, Hayden Pintier was pregnant. Cut off her hair. But then she cut off somebody's head, and then it was left with a cliffhanger. I'm like, what shows are you watching? Amazing. Oh, now, don't pout. You've got all this now. You're already in heaven. Oh, God. (laughs) Why worry about later? Oh, so I'm just the one who's sharing a bed with you, and these your declining years. Marcy, I want you to take care of me when I'm dead. I want my hair done by my own hairdresser, not the guy down at the mortuary. You know, the guy who does Al's hair. (laughs) I'm warning you, Marcy. I'm not going to soap up and dance for you until this is provided for. You have to tonight. My mother's coming. Marcy, I, I made that videotape for her so she wouldn't have to come over. Ugh. They make me very uneasy, these jokes about him dancing for her mother. Um, then he made a videotape so her mom can watch and not have to come over. I just want to know, like, when did... Marcy gets so chummy with her mother. You know, she used to hate her mom. And if you really want to be weird and try to, you know, I always try to make this whole show work, you know, all these little bits and pieces. I I like to imagine that after she got divorced from Steve, like she went to her mother for comfort, maybe called her on the phone or whatever, and then they became chummy again. And now with the new husband, now she watches her husband soap up and dance for her, which is just very weird. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't even think it necessarily is about being chummy with her mother. I think it's just a thing that she uses Jefferson to be her play toy with. Right to to act like like show it like show her trophy off, really. Right, and, and right. She's just right. like, oh, my mother. Yeah. You know? She's like, dance for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Look, mom, I got a hotter guy than you ever did. Daddy oh, wasn't this hot. <laughs> yeah, I'll show him off. It's more about her than actually her mother. It's yes. about her perception. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm telling you, I think I feel a headache coming on. <laughs> oh, all right. You know, I can't say no to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, Steve. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We are going home, and I am going to rock the Steve out of you, baby. It always works. So Jefferson says, I'm going to rock the Steve out of you, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. He, him with the baby is he so really yeah. is dumb, isn't he? He's so dumb. He's great. He's really dumb. <laughs> He's so stupid. Well, well, no, like if I was to come to you and be like, "Hey, I need you to rock the blank out of me," right, right, right. <laughs> He'd be like, "Screw you! If I have to do that, I ain't doing nothing." The, the, right, right. <laughs> it, it, it was knocked out of me. Like, the, the, the way, the, <laughs> the way I see Jefferson, though. Like, I love your laugh. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. Um, he doesn't want to rock the boat, so to speak. So he needs. What do you mean? Everybody wants to rock that Marcy Darcy boat, right? But what I'm, <laughs> no, what I'm saying though is clearly like she is a big part of the decision making. So 
he does whatever he has to do to make his life easier. To make her and, happy. And to keep that cush life going. Right. And be as happy and and, so he and, can continue to be the big dad, not the little dad. Exactly, <laughs> and get the things that he needs to, you know, get through the day. And I think that it's a mutual thing. But yeah, like Jefferson, just a lot of his not caring is kind of okay. I'm gonna go with Marcy just to kind of get what I want too. So with the whole thing with the, with you know the Steve thing or whatever, of course it doesn't bother him. He's just gonna flip that and use it too because Jefferson's a simple dude. He needs certain things in life, and that's how he's gonna get that. So there it is. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Only Dan can break it down like that. I kind of feel like this podcast has been very therapeutic for our relationship. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you guys are going to walk away a whole new couple. It's amazing. <laughs> you might even get married within a month. Give wow. me the milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go out and get that milk, Dan. Come on, redeem yourself. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyways. Al's been wearing the same white Hanes since 1979, but we can all take comfort in knowing that underwear from a tube made it into the rotation as well. As you guys remember, when Al was the sex, sexy guy of the neighborhood, and again, when uh, remember when Peg kept dressing up what I did for love, that episode? Yep. Remember, he, fi- he wanted her to keep cooking, so he pulled his underwear down and <laughs> chased her out of the bedroom. <laughs> Why don't you ever rock me, Al? Because I'd rather stone you. <laughs> you know, Peg, I've been thinking, I got one pair of clean underwear from that three-pack you bought me in the spring of 79. <laughs> I'd like to be buried in that. Fine. Impress Fuzzy with the underwear that I bought you for our 13th anniversary. So she says their 13th anniversary was in the spring of 79, which means that they've been married since 66. And that's the year they graduated high school. But in season one, they celebrate their 16th anniversary, which is 1987, which would make it 1971 they got married. And then in season six, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary, which means they were married in 1972. <laughs> so they should just stop. Referencing, Right, yeah. I agree. Well, I do have to point this out, too. So Peg says she wants her hair done by her own hairdresser, not a guy at a mortuary like the guy who does Al's hair. Now, Al's hair is done by Tony's dad in Cicero, according to Season 3, Episode 9. And uh, he was 97 years old in that episode, which would make him 103 years old now in Season 7. So I guess that guy died since he didn't make it to 103 and Al does now get his hair done by the guy at the mortuary. And for anybody who doesn't know what that means, it's the guy who styles dead people's hair before he puts them in a coffin for a wake. <laughs> Sounds like a uh, well, profession. The guy that plays the mortician is... Some dude, I don't know. I recognize his voice from somewhere. Uh, I don't know who he is. It's just some weird guy who's never been on the show before. Nobody can ever pronounce his name, so it doesn't matter. It's not Homer Simpson. <laughs> it is indeed. Well, you know, th- which is funny because, like, I was going to bring up a point of um, that was not me cracking open a beer, by the way. No, that was a Sprite. <laughs> um, no, uh, he really does. You know, I didn't know this until Dan told me that that was the voice of Homer Simpson. Um, I, I was like, I was like, if I had to like picture him as a cartoon character, he right. looks like Mr. Burns. Right? That's weird. Oh, wow. Does he do Mr. Burns? I, I don't know that at all, but he literally no, looks no. like him. He no. looks like Homer does a couple of people, but not not anyone like any other major. I think he does his dad or something like that. But he looks like <laughs> Mr. Burns. Excellent. Excellent. And I literally just did the finger thing. Smithers. Oh, you have to do the finger thing with it. <laughs> <laughs> the finger thing. <laughs> you know, you male corpses are all alike. <laughs> Never a thought for the woman who spent her life getting you into that grave. <laughs> you have no idea what it's like out there. A dead woman alone. No man is interested in a dead woman. And if he is, he wants a dead young woman. Oh, boy, my life is over. 
I'm going to be a dead woman with children. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who will want to marry a dead woman with children? Maybe Mickey Rooney. Yeah, by the time I'm dead, I'll be lucky if it's Andy Rooney. More pop culture references. Right, yeah. And then she says, by the time I'm dead, I'll be lucky if I'm if it's Andy Rooney, which <laughs> is weird because they're like the same age. Right. So that doesn't really make any sense. Like, what? One was born in 1920, and the other was born in 1919, so... did Now, did one have kind of a uh, a faster lifestyle? Maybe that was... Well, yeah, the, Mickey Rooney was married eight times, and the other dude, Andy, was only married once. Okay. So, yeah, it was... Uh, maybe one was just less popular, I guess. So the, the loser one is Andy Rooney, I suppose, right? right? So, it, that's what I think it is, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm not kidding, Al. I want to be buried with you. <laughs> I feel a wine coming on. Oh, God, no. Yeah, yeah. I feel it coming. my whole life may as well ruin my death oh well oh well indeed so real quick though uh dan castanelletta castanel why can't i do this uh anyway he was on Mary with children before in season five episode five the dance show and he played a gay man who was jealous because his husband was dancing at a a a dance club uh, but like an adult not you know not like a drug crazy so not the nudie bar <laughs> <laughs> yeah nothing like that like a sophisticated ballroom almost dancing type place um and he so i i take it he's not the same gay gentleman that he was he's a completely different character here right because he's nothing like that. So it's interesting that they just didn't care. It was only... I mean, it was two seasons ago, but... Yes. Well, seasons felt like years apart, though. <clears throat> yeah, right. It, in a weird way, though, we just... I feel like we just recorded on this episode. <laughs> I know, dude. And what's weird, we've had girls, Lacey, that were... They were in the Weenie Tots episode, and one to two episodes later, they're Bud's girlfriend, and they're completely different character. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and I remember specifically you saying when he came in as the gay guy there, you were like, he comes back, you know, later on, and and here we are. And it doesn't feel like that long ago. But then again, I know what you're saying as well, where it definitely does. Like, that was that was a long time ago that we recorded that, you know? Oh, I guess so, yeah. I mean, it's we, every episode is another week. So, uh, maybe it's not too long. Maybe it's only 50... So, that's, that's one year ago. Okay. Right. For us, it's one year ago. It's great. Can we just say how crazy it is that The Simpsons are still going? And guess what? This is their best season in 10 to 15 years no really dude oh listen i'm an apologist and i i could tolerate new simpsons more than most people okay and but even i walk away from plenty of episodes like uh, okay what, what right. was the point of this um and especially the tree houses oh like basically always disappoint me uh, yeah uh, honestly yeah, um, yeah so we're doing the 31 days of halloween as we talked about earlier and Dan is like, they're the best, apparently, you know, and he, we got to watch those. We got to talk about them because we were talking about TV shows, which, you know, honestly, some of the best sitcoms have the best uh, Halloween episodes. Yeah. And he was like, we got to watch the Treehouse episodes. Oh, yeah. So we sit down to watch them and I'm like, this is freaking stupid. Well, the new ones are. This is pre-asking Alex, though, because you you let me know a bunch of them to watch, Alex. Yeah, I, gear, I geared you to the right ones. But it, but we um, were too late, and, and by the time... And I was all set. Right, so she already thinks it's stupid. <sighs> yeah, like, I, but you know what, though? I think that's a big part of it, Alex, is um, it's such a unique, like, amalgamation of two things that 
you know, they kind of used it as a uh, kind of like a, a vehicle to just do whatever they wanted with the episode as opposed to keep it horror, keep it scary, keep it fun, keep right. it even, uh, even surrounded, uh, you know, even in the same stratosphere as Halloween. You know, a lot of those episodes, the most Halloween things were like the intros and then they go. Yeah, right. Then it's a Transformers parody. Right, dude. It was yeah. weird. So no, do the first fifteen spectacular. Yep. Stop there. Yeah. yeah we'll we'll fo- no, we'll focus on those though uh, next year, baby. <laughs> we'll, okay. uh, yeah, Fair I'm gonna enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna get Alex's top ten, and we're gonna watch those. All right, we'll do. That. Yep. Here's a fine casket. Very nice. And this one is top of the line, solid bronze. With a comfy velvet lining. <laughs> oh my God, there's a dead man in it. Harry, he looks like somebody dug him up. <laughs> How long was I out? <laughs> so Al sleeping in a coffin like Dracula. And it's funny, I've been on a Dracula kick lately. Um, I got a lot of gifts from someone or but just a bunch of blu-rays and they're all hammer movies they're all like just sort of obscure uh 80s dracula movies and stuff so i've been just watching uh all of them i'm gonna watch john carpenter's vampires pretty soon i got and i just for some reason i got it in my head like uh, a really cheesy 90s movie like Ed O'Neill as Count Dracula. <laughs> right? Like, can you imagine if he really played Dracula? So, did you see the new Netflix Dracula? I know. Three, you're the third person now to mention it and in one day. And uh, so everyone's saying it's great, so now I will definitely check that out. It's only three episodes I heard. That's perfect. Dracula? The, the new one? Yeah. Well, no, I was no. asking, had you checked out? We haven't, so no. I'm looking for your, your endorsement. Nope, I don't have one yet. Nope. <laughs> fair enough, sir, fair enough. Gee, they must have smelled your father's socks. <laughs> I guess Al's foot problem was not cured as a result of the breaking Lower Uncton's curse. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I do. And you know what? I relate (laughs) because Dan has a foot problem. What do you mean? What foot problem? (laughs) Well, your feet smell. What are you talking about? Well, when you work out all day. What do they smell like? What do you mean? <laughs> You've never said anything about my. Well, feet. you wear boots and like you know they smell like crap. He's a working man. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's manly. That's cool. You should see yeah. the best hair I'm getting right no, now. No, it's manly. You're right. As long as you shower. I mean, you do, right? I'm gonna shed two tears for wow. me and Dan's relationship later because he's giving me the best hair. <laughs> yeah, this was going good for you guys. Now it's going okay. Let's just n- no more hair and foot stuff, <laughs> right? Let's just stay away from the top and bottom of Dan. Well, honestly, like as I was watching like today, like it's been a while since I've watched Married with Children. To be honest with you, and to see uh, Peg and Al's, you know, banter back and forth, like I was like. Holy crap. It was some of the best. I, I was like, this is how me and Dan are. It really is. Like, it really does <laughs> epitomize, like, a real couple. Like, you know. At some time. Like, I mean, it does get, like, to the corny where, like, the, these are conversations that are never going to be had between a couple. But then there are those real moments. Yeah, right. So I, that's one of the – I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things where I think a lot of couples can relate. Mm-hmm. You know, Alex, too, I've heard you <laughs> with your wife oh, yeah. in certain conversations and it's some of the funniest stuff ever because <laughs> it is so relatable. But it, it's so, like, cliche and how everybody falls but into the – But it's real. But it's, that's what I'm saying. It's real <laughs> as all hell. But that's what makes it hilarious, too. And that's where you have to kind of – find the humor in life because well listen you know life can get mundane you know you gotta find ways to you know especially to break up the monotony without a doubt without a doubt and i think that (laughs) no i definitely do that and it sounds like you guys do you have to though or or else you just become like a cog in the wheel but you know we have so much fun together though. that's what i'm saying and and alex and his wife do too and that's what i'm saying like you have to though you have to spice things up you have to switch things up you have to constantly and like, that's what's so great about you know stoke that fire alan peg is that they do have those real moments that you right. know i think that's what 
people relate to about the show is the real moments. We, we I wish I was as witty as they were when we have like our. Well, 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 wait, we, I, I feel like we are. Though. I feel. I feel like, like no, you're this good. This episode specifically. I'm okay. though, this episode specifically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I'm like, all right, I'm gonna come in on top of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, this episode shows, like, you know, despite what they these rippings they do to each other, they truly love each other. Right, right. And he's like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to, like, if I was Alex, I'm going to get buried next to Steve Dash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know what's so funny about you saying that? Uh-oh. When... When I was watching this, and like Lacey pointed out earlier, how we relate, the three of us can relate to Al being the only, you know, asswipe at this guy's funeral. Like, I literally was thinking that would be me with, like, Steve Dash's funeral. (laughs) I'd be the only guy saying, yeah, he was Jason in part two, you know? And and then you say that. That is the weirdest thing, because now you said exactly what I was thinking earlier, but didn't even mention to anybody. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, but Steve Dash was obviously more loved and remembered than uh, this freaking guy. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. So there were people at his funeral. It's basically uh, Brad Pitt's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, basically. If I may be so bold, set aside the funds you were going to spend today. And trust us to handle the details when the dark day comes. What? I thought you said that we were just going to throw them on the grill and flush their ashes down the toilet. Have you changed your mind? What are you, getting soft? (laughs) You two scamps certainly have a fine sense of humor. (laughs) Honey, we have to buy and we have to buy today. You know what, this is like probably one of the most morbid episodes of television that I've ever actually watched. Really? Yeah. Well, I used to be a, um, you know, I worked for insurance for a long time. I I don't anymore, but I did. And, you know, a lot of the times they were trying to cash in and, you know, get money to pay for a funeral. And I always thought this was like this was a thing back in the past. I don't I don't even know if people still do this, but they would go pick out their own plots or right. you know their caskets of what they wanted. I mean, I think maybe now just rich people do that because mm-hmm. the economy that we live in, we can't obviously afford to go do that. Yeah. But um, you know, it's it's a very morbid thing to do to go pick out your own casket in your own plot. I feel like that's very morbid. What do you guys? It's very morbid and. The thing is, I wouldn't waste a dime of my money. I'm I'm going to use it while I'm alive. I could care less what happens to me when I'm dead. I'm not going to spend any time or money on that. Exactly. Cremate me. Like, like how, it's the cheapest. How? To decide, because I think this would have been the true Bundy way, if they were so to decide to be... Bundy. Exactly. But if they decided <laughs> to say that while being cremated... They could have avoided this whole thing with moving and, and all this craziness. What? Are you saying you don't want me to be buried on top of you? I'm saying that I don't think the Bundys would care. But I'm asking you. Oh, no, that's fine, baby. We just <laughs> okay, so we can, everything. So we can pay $100. We're, yeah, we'll get a ghost face shaped coffin and you right on top of me. <laughs> My nose hairs will grow a tree. It'll be beautiful. I hope so. <laughs> Do you want to grow a tree, Alex? Yeah, sure. <laughs> do, you, do you think Tiffany would be okay with you growing a tree? With my nose hair? Um, well, I do have a nose hair problem, actually. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, she always comments, "Hun, you got to cut your nose hairs." Like I feel like I'm Al Bundy half the time. Like she literally points out, every, like I'm having such a good day and with my friends laughing and I'm right? looking around. All of a sudden, I turn, I look at her, she goes, "Babe." Please tuck your nose hair in, <laughs> and and my smile just goes completely away, just, and I'm like, just God, complete yeah, despair. I'm like, get me out of here. Like, you are literally one of my favorite people, right? <laughs> one of the most relatable people <laughs> ever, like, on, like not ever. only on the network but ever. Thank you. You too. Yeah, every time we do shows, we find this out about each other. Oh, Alex, like, you said that the last time we recorded was um, uh, less than zero. Less than zero, but that's actually not true. It was Bohemian. Yes, yes. yes. Nice. 
I thought I might be wrong. I didn't know. Yeah, I thought I thought about <laughs> we that. We definitely earlier. need you back on. Yeah, dude, we got to do one soon. But wait, we'll, wait, we're gonna talk about okay. that. You know what? How about when I make Dan watch Ghost? Perfect. What? I thought you said that we were just gonna throw them on the grill and flush their ashes down the toilet. <laughs> Have you changed your mind? What are you getting soft? Bud and Kelly plan to throw Alan Pegg on the grill and cook him till they're ash. Then flush the ashes down the toilet. Now, Al might like that. <laughs> yeah, as long as it goes bawoosh, I think he'd be fine with it. <laughs> like the episode where he's obsessed with toilets. You like this one? Yes, I do. Well, I don't. I'd like to see something else. We need a little more room up top, you know, for my hair. Oh, yes. Well, with a little customizing, we can give you a bubble top. Designed to bring big hair safely into eternity. <laughs> Gee, Al, I have a bubble top. <laughs> and you will, as long as they make strong bras. Oh. <laughs> you love the guys. I do. <laughs> I must say, you two are planning your funeral a bit early. You must have some terminal disease. <laughs> yes, uh... Marriage. <laughs> ah, yes. We get quite a few of those. Most people feel that marriage eases the transition to death. I'm, I'm super <laughs> glad that I was not married long enough to where we had already plotted our family Well, plot. so, so <laughs> check this out, though. No, so I have kind of a unique perspective of this. So What do you mean a well, unique perspective? So I worked in a graveyard for the past <laughs> month. Uh, okay, blow, you're me out. Blowing leaves out of it, and a lot. <laughs> no, 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 check this out, though. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, just Alex's laugh just there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was blowing leaves out of a graveyard. That's what I did. That's literally. No, 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 I thought this he. This is my life now. No, he says. I have a unique perspective. It is. It is I was unique. Blowing the leaves. Well, no, check this out. So, so let me ask you a question. So, if you're blowing leaves in a graveyard. Uh, what would you be doing? You're looking at all the graves. So you're like face to face with all of them, right? Unique perspective. There you go. Okay. So what I saw. We'll go with that. What, no, what I, <laughs> uh, what I saw was a lot of family plots. Uh, most of them are family plots. You know, a lot of them are um, husband, wife, a lot of kids. And that was the most disturbing thing, too, especially um, from the 1800s. Aww. A lot of a lot of dead babies. Like, there were a lot of uh, okay. kids' graves. Well, oh, yeah, because they had no medicine. Right. Exactly. That, that's like, what it was. They but, but, like, you would see that the two parents' graves were big, and then there's two smaller ones. With oh, it's so kids. depressing. Did they die I during know. the Oregon Trail? It doesn't... <laughs> they, did, <laughs> they couldn't get the horses across the water, baby. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I'm picturing. But check it out. It... it it is family plot oriented, though. Uh, he died of dysentery. One of the Oregon two. Trail! Wow. He fled Oregon Trail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor sanitation, fever. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, I see some customers. So we are going to burn them to a crisp. Yes, that's what I was trying to tell you. Say, you no. kids dying? <laughs> no, virgins are just pale. <laughs> Thus, the healthy hue on her face. Obviously, the joke is that she's the complete opposite of a virgin. Instead, she had sex with like a you know fifty guys or whatever. But the <laughs> the irony is that Kelly is just as pale as Bud is. Mm -hmm. Well, and she's not slutty anymore. Right again, we're doing a a worded joke, but we can't get any action or clothes going with her. Right. Well, I mean, you look at her like honestly, you look at um. You know, Sue Ellen. Right. And Sue Ellen was not, um, you know, promiscuous. Right. You know. Except with Brian, the hot, the hot dog guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Yeah, clown dog. Like, how did he get on and that? And you know what? I'm sorry, song? but I'm seriously offended I was not on that episode. Because <laughs> thank you, Katrina. Uh, yes. Ooh. Well, Dan said it a bunch of times, so that was an honor of you. Yeah, exactly. See? It's an honor. Uh, everything he said on that episode Because <laughs> yeah. he's like, I have to watch this episode. Or he's like, I have to watch this movie, but I don't have it. And yeah. I'm just like, all right, let's watch it together. <laughs> and so we bought it. He 
you literally had nothing to say during that whole movie, but I was just like, react. I was loving it. I was react- it's like, is that Daniel Harris? Yeah, no, I was <laughs> reacting to it. Right. And that's what he brought to yourself. So you're welcome. That was one right. of the funniest <laughs> moments ever, like that we shared that I had to. I had to just highlight on the show because thank you, Katrina. It's just one of my favorite lines. And why is that, though? Because of you. Wow, I guess Lacey's one of our best writers. Thanks. She is, dude. No, like, I swear, like, 40% of the show is just her feeding me stuff that I You regurgitating everything Lacey says during an episode? Exactly. Well, no, No. guys, I'm not funny uh, unless it comes out of Danji's mouth. (laughs) That's true either. No, it is true. It sounds funny. It it does sound funnier coming through him. Because I'm a buffoon. Well, no, you're you're a male. Because I'm I'm your jester. (laughs) I'm like your Katrina in her jester suit. (laughs) That's what it is. And, and the great thing was, is, you know, it still left it open to where the writers could reference her past, but yet you're not going to show episodes her doing those same things. So it, it's not that it's not fair game, because it is, but we're moving beyond that, which honestly, I mean, that's true to real life, too. You know, I mean, people grow older and people change, and I, I'm not trying to get too serious about it, but. You know, maybe she did kind of move away from that uh, as a character, as in her real life, too. And it was a reflection of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, now we get to the recommendation of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coffin. (laughs) Wow. Yes, indeed, Yoso. Let's talk coffin, shall we? Ah, this one just screams you, young (laughs) fellow. This is our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle coffin. Of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, everybody knows. Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird. Uh, the cartoon, the famous cartoon, ran from 87 to 96, practically the same run as Married with Children. Because wow. that was 87 to 97, yeah. You know, Shredder was like, tonight I died on turtle soup. <laughs> Uncle Phil that I referenced earlier, yeah. Uncle Phil, yeah, man. Oh, yeah, exactly. There you go. Yep. It's all tied together. So, yeah, Turtles is probably... My top three cartoons of all time. It's Hands like, down. I agree. I yeah, agree. that original run is amazing, man. Um, I have every episode on DVD. Uh, and, of course, everyone knows the movies. That's one of my favorite movies of all time, the original one. They just put the first, I believe, two, maybe three on Netflix just recently. So, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, watch that first movie if you have it, the 1990 movie. Amazing. Amazing movie. Never pay full fr- price for late pizza. Late pizza. Yep. Um, so this – Dan, would you be willing – and I'm totally serious. Would you be willing to be buried in that coffin? Uh, I think he would. Yeah. I mean it's – I would. Huge- like I can't think – I can't think of any other coffin that I would <laughs> rather be buried in. What about the top of you? Well, yeah, no. You'll be on top too, but we're going in a turtle <laughs> shell, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah that's so much nicer than a, a a kiss coffin or a wooden typical coffin right and that's what i'm saying but i feel like the dynamic between Lacey lou and i there would be minimal conversation because it's a ninja turtle coffin and there really is no conversation beyond that like why would you disagree with that that's what we're doing you guys could spoon in that coffin i understand michael jackson got one from a caller it's a surprise. <laughs> People don't name their kids Macaulay ever, but right. this one famous person was named. <laughs> like I want, I want someone to bring that back. Like, aren't you dying to say what are you gonna name them? Can we just pause for a moment and give a moment of silence for the death of the name Macaulay. Macaulay, yeah, the name that will never really and have never heard in real life. All ever. right, thirty seconds. Let's okay, go. Okay, we have a show to do. Okay, right. ready? So <laughs> yeah, people are like, what are we listening to? <laughs> um, so him and Michael Jackson were friends in real life. Uh, it was after Macaulay Culkin starred in Home Alone's 1990, the 1990 movie Home Alone, that then 10-year-old 
Macaulay received a random phone call from Michael Jackson. Jackson told Culkin that he understood the pressures of child fame and he offered to be his friend. Culkin then became a regular at the Neverland Ranch, starred in Michael Jackson's black or white music video, and he was named the godfather of Jackson's daughter Paris in 1998. Culkin has said that nothing inappropriate ever happened with Michael Jackson, nor did he witness anything. He was like Joe Pesci, on the other hand. Yeah, Joe Pesci tried to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to bite my fingers off one by one. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We also talked about all the, you know, the guys like, gosh darn it, all that stuff, that Yosemite Sam. Uh, Joe Pesci stole that from Yosemite Sam for Home Alone. Because it was a children's movie and he couldn't straight out curse, even though Macaulay Culkin called him a horse's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Your horse's ass? Yeah. Come come get me, a horse's ass. <laughs> Kids, don't you think that daddy should wear his wedding ring when he's dead? I married you till death do us part, which means when I'm dead, I'm free to date. <laughs> <laughs> yes, technically. Makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. So now we're at the end of the episode um, at Al's final resting place next to Fuzzy McGee. The set uh, didn't look real. I, I never felt like I was outside, right? You guys didn't get the impression this was filmed outdoors, right? Never. No, Not once. It, it literally looked like Tim Burton's um, Beetlejuice. <laughs> right? You know, it like did. when they dig him up. It yeah, really that's a good point. Oh, yeah? I got to pay attention to that next time. And like I said, we're going to surely check this episode out on that horrible, horrible day when Ed O'Neill passes. I mean, I, which I hope is like 20 years from now, because I think only at age 60 can I deal with that. <laughs> you know, like, right. I don't think I could deal in the next uh, 10 years or so. This is it? This is your final resting place? Well, there's no spot for me. That's why it's called a resting place. <laughs> well, it sucks. I want to be buried above ground I don't like all those insects bothering me They always bite me It's because I'm so sweet <laughs> Maybe it's because the 200 bonbons she puts away every week The name bonbon uh, came from the reduplication of the word bon Meaning good in French So it means a good 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 I want another spot. Well, fine, Peg, get yourself another spot. But I have my spot. I'm going to be buried next to the fuzzball. You'd better let me know if you don't want it, because Fuzzy McGee was considered a genius in France. I believe they called him Le Grand Fuzz. <laughs> and when news of his passing hits Paris, this place will be swarming with a lot ruder people than you two. I was smart to buy when I did. Now, I believe that this is a reference to Jerry Lewis as a misunderstood genius who was not appreciated in his home country, because Jerry Lewis was always a subject of deep transatlantic misunderstanding. He's one that triggered sarcasm in the United States and bewilderment in France. And while some Americans felt embarrassed by this contortionist comic, the French embraced Jerry Lewis's humor as both abstract art and social satire of American life. Would you tuck that big hair back into your nose? <laughs> now do you see why I ordered a bubble top for him, too? <laughs> you know, by the way... I have heard that your nose hairs continue to grow after death. So could you bury him face up? That way, the nose hairs can sort of break through, and it'll be like we have our own tree. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be free. <laughs> anyway, I want to be buried next to Al. So this is what we're going to do. We're just going to move Fuzzy over. Who's got that one next to him? That's reserved for his beloved mule. <laughs> well... Certainly, we can move the mule. We'll just chop him up and bury him in some crummy cans of dog food. <laughs> that way, everybody's a winner. Then, we dig up the fuzzer, put him into the mule hole, and I will go here. Then Al and I can be together forever. Well, hasn't it already been forever? <laughs> let me just pretend we're in bed and let me take care of everything. <laughs> How much for everything? All right, let's see. That's bubble tops, digging up dead man, ignoring deceased last wish, grinding up mule into pulp, 
tax plus tip. Let's say twenty-seven thousand dollars. <laughs> well, uh, we might have to cut out a few frills.、Um... <laughs> Which, in today's money, is roughly like sixty thousand, a little less than sixty thousand. Yes, triple. Right. <laughs> How much is it if it's just for the two plots and you toss us in? That depends. Are we doing the digging or are you? <laughs> well, I figured the wife would. <laughs> Let's cut to the bottom of the grave, sir. What do you have to spend? A hundred dollars. <laughs> you looky loos. It's people like you who take the joy out of death. So "looky loo" is a relatively new term that entered the American lexicon in the late 1700s. He walks away to go check out some other sick-looking people, and Al chats it up with Fuzzy when he's laying there pretending to be dead already. Oh say, you folks look real sick, and your daughter looks like she'd be mighty grateful to save a buck. If you know what I mean. Peg, it's a shame we don't have enough money to bury you. <laughs> But I'm gonna be dead alone. Oh man, I can't wait. <laughs> Well, Peg, I don't care about you. You work it out for yourself. Bury yourself wherever you want. I'm not moving. <laughs> well, Fuzzy, just me and you now. Thank God she'd have driven you crazy. <laughs> and by the way, in case you ever heard, I never would let her move that gum, and I love that damn mule. Hey, by the way, we might be getting a tree. <laughs> oh man, the time we're gonna have! I'll tell you about all my high school football stories, and you can tell me where they used to go to the bathroom in the old west. <laughs> my guess is it's by the horse, so you can blame him. Okay, Al, we took care of everything, and it's only gonna cost you a hundred dollars. It doesn't involve moving me. Nope, you can stay right where you are next to Fuzzy. Fine, then I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing, Peg? Well, I'm just showing you where I'm gonna be. We're gonna share a grave. They're gonna stack us. <laughs> Isn't that great? And whoever dies first is on the bottom. Well, that'll be me. I know. <laughs> And then you get to a very sad final shot that says this is reserved for、uh, Al Bundy、uh. or something, something like that. What does it say? I don't even remember. You no, know, that's exactly what it says.、Yeah. Yep. It does, right? So, how many Bosco-shaped coffins are we <laughs> purchasing? <laughs> oh my God! You literally just spit up on me <laughs> <laughs> from a creepy salesman <laughs> for this episode out of five, Dan. Wow! So, <laughs> so that was such a good、uh, little drop in there, Alex. That she literally just spit her soda all over me. Yeah, I did. Well, that, that's true story. That was classic.、Uh, so, all right, I give this episode. This episode was so. How many Bosco coffins? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <sighs> all right. Do so, heroes in a half shell. So I thought the jokes throughout were were so atypical, married with children, and I mean that in the best way possible. Like everything was so on point with this episode, and in a lot of ways. It really brought it back to what makes this show great, and I know in this season, it's been criticized for kind of going off the rails for this reason, for that、Seven. reason. But yeah, exactly, even the way that they dealt with him, though, it felt so perfect. It felt like they were a real show. They were back to form <laughs> in every sense of the word. Add in Homer Simpson. I, I honestly, I give this five Bosco shells out of five. Wow. Yeah,、oh. I love this episode. It was everything. It it was something I needed at at this point in the run. Oh, in your life, I need that too. I <laughs> need I needed them to dial it back. I needed them to hone in, and they did exactly that. And what I loved about it was his and Peg's banter.、Um, you know, the Kelly joke. Everything, everything was so on par that it it, it was. It's a five. But that five kind of crept up on me. 
Exactly. I I have something similar to say. Yeah. Please. Yeah. How many Bosco shaped coffins are you purchasing from a creepy guy? Out of five, Lacey. Oh, you're going to me. Yes. <laughs> I thought you had. <laughs> I thought it was going to you. <laughs> you know, there are only so many bald turtles. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You start with that. Well, okay. I mean, like, we we only role play, you know, Bosco. This is true. <laughs> wait, uh, what? Dan's Bosco and you're Steve, like trying to throw him into the bed or something. <laughs> Bosses me like a rag well, doll. Well, well no, we like to say that I'm Jefferson <laughs> because of heaven now, and we only temporarily call him Steve, but <laughs> never. Uh, no, this episode. He's gonna rock it out of you. Uh, this is this show is very crucial to my childhood, and thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. For coming on. Um, no, I ha- I feel like I have really big shoes to fill with Jamie being gone, you know, and um, I hope you know Brian's doing well and her as well. Yes, get well, Brian. Yes. Yes, please. So uh, for this episode specifically. Four Bosco coffins. Four out of five. Yeah, because there are definitely better episodes. Um, but this was a lot of fun to watch. Right, right. You you almost have to take it down to a four, maybe four point five. Well, you rated it a five, so shut up. You can't talk no more. To reserve it for the <laughs> ones that you love. I personally love this episode, but yeah. 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 Definitely. And Alex? Uh man, you know, it's weird. As a kid, I I never thought anything of this episode. Right. Admittedly, I I thought it was oh yeah the one where Al's at the plot and blah 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 who cares, and I never really revisited it that much unless I just kept the DVD going. Right. In watching it, I was it struck me how good the writing and how strong it was and how fresh it f- still felt. Like Dan said, it's very married with children yet. It's still fresh and so strong. I was just very taken back by that. And um, now with you guys discussing it, it my rating just kept creeping up. Yeah. You know, big... I would say it was probably in my mind at 2.5. What? From, from my kid days, yeah. From last watch, I would say 3.5. Okay. And then talking about it and realizing what this really is, it's a 4.5. Yes! Yeah. And And that's what podcasters do to each other, folks. That's fun. Yeah. We make appreciation. Right. Yeah. It's like we point out things and bring up highlights and little nuances that you may have missed just staring at the TV. And it's like... Wow, no, there's so much more going on. Look how it affected you guys. Look how you it brought stories out of you. Look at what how this this is like the longest show literally. This might top the Sam Kennison <laughs> show in length. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, look, honestly, this episode is, you know, kind of the epitome of what uh the average adult goes through. Right. Right. It was it spoke to us. Yeah, it really did, and I didn't think that it would. Right, <laughs> right. It's, it's a freaking episode of Married with Children. Yeah. I mean, I've even started to censor myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so stupid, like, him wanting to be, be buried next to a, a totally nonsense... But, of course, you know, like we said... That's non fuzzy's nonsensical to the world in, in there, but we would do the same thing if, uh, you know, Dan's guy from, you know, Scream or whatever died oh and nobody... Oh, uh, Brian Cranston. Right. Exactly. Right. So, we, we can relate, because we're... we're <laughs> I guess Al's as into watching stuff as we are, I guess, right? He's willing to be buried next to the guy. Right. <laughs> And thank God that Fuzzy was buried in Chicago in driving distance, right? I mean, what are the odds of that? Well, yeah, and, right, and right. thank God Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. bear. Fuzzy, thank Fuzzy God. Fuzzy wasn't so Fuzzy Wuzzy. Fuzzy? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Peg is Fuzzy. Somebody got to get her some nair.